My name is Jeffrey Kahn, and I'm the host of Digital Oil & Gas, the podcast that looks at the impact of digital technology on the oil and gas industry. If you want to discuss this week's topic further, or just stay in touch, you can always reach me at Jeffrey Kahn on Twitter or at JeffreyCann.com. This podcast is entitled Digital and the Geopolitics of Oil. Oil is used by some nations to project influence and power and is a national security concern for most others. How does digital innovation alter the oil-infused geopolitical landscape? I was part of a workshop recently to discuss the geopolitics of oil. The conversation revolved around the decisions that OECD nations are making that impact the energy security profile of consumer nations and the risks of man-made future catastrophic supply disruption. While it was not a direct focus of our meeting, digital issues kept creeping into the analysis, which gave me pause to consider a question. How is this wave of digital innovation playing into the geopolitics of the global oil industry? If you don't pay that much attention to the shadowy world of oil politics, here's just a few of the things that international oil analysts consider. Number one is OPEC. OPEC, that club of oil exporting countries, is still a major player in the world of oil, shipping some 33 million barrels per day. Sure, their share has drifted down to just 30% of global supply, far from the heady days when two-thirds of every mile driven was supplied by nations that most Westerners wouldn't consider as holiday destinations. Team OPEC has its challenges. The Saudis and the Qataris are not in good terms at the moment. Venezuela is collapsing. Iran is again under sanctions and Iraq is slowly recovering from insurrection. Even Libya is still straining from Muammar Gaddafi's broken rule. Because of OPEC's importance to global oil markets, most nations treat OPEC countries with a good deal of latitude, despite the poor treatment of their citizenry, see Arab Spring, their attitudes towards women, Saudi Arabia only just let women drive, and the conditions of their imported foreign workers. And how about Russia? Over the years, Russia hasn't hesitated to use its immense global gas supply as a geopolitical tool. Gazprom has repeatedly cut off gas supply to Europe because it objects to the trade practices of the transit nation, Ukraine. Germany is highly dependent on Russian gas supply and has signed long-term gas supply contracts, which sometimes makes it difficult for Germany to oppose with vigor some of Russia's adventures. Now Russia appears to be operating in concert with OPEC, making it OPEC+, plus, or perhaps ROPEC, a nifty trick since, in theory, Russia's oil companies are supposed to be independent of the Kremlin. With Russian production at 11 million barrels, ROPEC is more like 45% of global production and therefore of considerable influence in global markets. With its increased geopolitical heft, OPEC has Russia's back after all, Russia can more effectively apply pressure on its customers to agree to its policies and actions, such as military intervention in neighboring nations, or turn a blind eye to the questionable behavior of its partners, thinking here the disappearance of Jamal Khashoggi, in exchange for favorable trade terms. Another factor is rising U.S. oil production. The explosive growth of new U.S. oil supplies from previously untamed shale has shifted the U.S. in the short span of just five years, from importer, dependent on global oil supplies, to the world's largest single oil producer nation, and a major oil exporter. U.S. demand for oil itself has been flat for years, despite annually adding 15 million new drivers to its market. By the way, that's testament to the deep shift towards a fuel-light service economy, the efficiency of engine technology, and changing consumer behavior. This shift in fortunes reduces the ability of oil supplier nations to the U.S. from applying pressure on the U.S. political system. It also means that U.S. sanctions applied to nations like Iran do not sting the U.S. domestic economy as much, which is now better insulated from the global oil market. Another factor is shifting demand. BP's excellent energy statistics highlight the flat demand for oil in the OECD economies, in addition to the U.S. So where is all the growth? Well, China and other growing Asian economies. Supplier nations are all effectively fighting over the very large and attractive Chinese marketplace. Paradoxically, China's government has made it clear their intent to move away from fossil fuels for energy so as to clean up their air, and as a side measure, reduce their dependency on U.S. currency markets. China, as a big oil importer, but with a strong industrial policy towards clean energy, will be able to seek favorable trade terms with exporters in exchange for market access. And then there's the defense of trade. 
Historically, U.S. dependence on imported oil translated into its self-imposed large defense expenditures to police global trade routes through the Gulf, the canals of Suez and Panama, the straits around Singapore, and the South China Sea. That warm defense blanket helps Taiwan keep its independence, Japan to maintain only a defensive military, Israel to exist, the Philippines to grow, and South Korea to hum along. With the U.S. now oil independent, the defense industry needs a new boogeyman. Enter China, stage Far East, and a fresh sanctions program. And lastly, disciplining the unruly. A good way, some say, to bring rogue nations to their senses is to apply sanctions on them that deny access to international banking or markets for their products. This cuts off hard currency, and with nations like Iran highly dependent on its oil exports, a ban on Iranian oil really hurts. Conveniently, if you're in the market to export oil, as is the U.S. now, sanctions are a really good way for domestic exporters who are able to step into markets suddenly vacated. There are curious parallels between ROPEC's use of oil production to tame the neighbors and the U.S.'s use of the global banking system to do the same thing. I can see digital playing increasingly into the geopolitical world of oil and with unpredictable effects. First is in understanding the resource base. It might not be in the best interests of national oil companies and governments to have their resource data accessible in cloud environments. That data has strategic value in situations where nations are potentially competing for market access or capital. For example, Australia, a major gas exporting nation, does not actually have a national database of detailed subsurface information because the resources are actually a state responsibility. A state, such as China, could gain strategic insight because of its ability to take a position in each of the oil and gas projects underway. Next is monitoring assets on the move. Digital technology is enabling far better surveillance of oil assets from afar. Crude oil ships may all look alike to the untrained human eye, but with enough data to work with, artificial intelligence can learn to distinguish between crude carriers, whether they're loaded or unloaded, and based on speed and track, their likely destination. A common tactic by the unscrupulous, which is to turn off vessel tracking devices, can be met by having an artificial intelligence machine consume the overnight satellite video feed and identify the ghost ships. Sanctions will take on a whole new level of enforcement. Similarly, the presence of construction equipment, such as cranes, or greatly increased numbers of cars or trucks on site could signal expansion or turnaround, the ideal time to apply trade pressure. And how about technology transfer? As more and more technology becomes cloud-enabled and digital, that technology is more easily transferred or sold over networks without a trace in violation of trade rules that may prohibit such sale and transfer. Eventually, blockchain solutions that enable tracking of digital assets will make it easier to detect such illegal activity. Other clever mechanisms could include a call home feature for all software to secure a constantly changing secret code that unlocks the software for its users. And what about cyber? The digital underworld has many markets for buying and selling hacks, identities, malicious code, Trojan horses, and other bits of nefarious technology. This market activity provides another inexpensive tool set to enable geopolitical actors to press their advantage. Imagine a scenario where an oil exporting state actor hacks into its customer's oil infrastructure. Monitoring customer product volumes can enable advantageous trade strategies. At another extreme, a state actor could disrupt power energy infrastructure and force its customer to purchase more expensive oil, in a kind of ransom. In the case of environmental activism, hackers could break into plant infrastructure, distort data flows from key sensors, and fool systems and human operators into taking incorrect action. As infrastructure fails, regulators respond with more stringent supervision that ultimately blocks legitimate investments and prevents economically valuable projects from proceeding. And how about shifting currency away from the U.S. dollar? An intriguing digital innovation would be the adoption of a non-sovereign digital currency or stablecoin to serve as the settlement currency for oil. This digital innovation could permanently shift the global reliance on the U.S. dollar and the U.S. banking system away to a neutral market participant. It would effectively neuter the ability of the U.S. government to apply oil trade sanctions to nations it doesn't like. That is the concept behind the Venezuelan Petro, a cryptocurrency backed by Venezuela's oil assets. Unfortunately, Venezuela has not engendered the kind of trust that is necessary to overhaul oil pricing and trade, 
but the possibility that China could help create such a currency should not be ignored. And lastly, how about fingerprinting oil? Crude oil has no DNA, but crude oil cargoes often contain unique biological traces that contain DNA. These genetic markers can sometimes precisely identify the exact source and field from which the crude oil was pumped. Coupled with new digital tools that can rapidly process crude assays and blockchain for recording the assays and originating cargoes on a secure registry, oil can suddenly be traced through its life cycle, much like how Walmart tracks pork in China. Digital solutions may make it increasingly difficult for oil customers to purchase crude oil from states under sanction by removing the cloud of mystery around oil source. So in conclusion, the politics of oil will go on forever, so long as they're a market. However, digital innovations will trigger adjustments to these geopolitical gyrations. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this podcast, be sure to subscribe to the show. You can find Digital Oil & Gas on Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And please tell a friend about the show. If you have a minute, please leave a review and a rating on iTunes, as that helps others find the show along with other great content. You can follow Jeffrey on Twitter, at Jeffrey Can, or on LinkedIn. Also, look for Jeffrey's new book, entitled Bits, Bites, and Barrels, The Digital Transformation of Oil & Gas, on Amazon and other fine online bookshops. Thanks for listening to this episode of Digital Oil & Gas. The podcast returns next Wednesday, so tune in then.